when we get an acre of pollinator habitat, we have to make it the best it can be because we don't have enough acres of it. If we try to solve pollinator health and habitat using the same tools and techniques we've been using for the last decade, we will fail. This episode features a conversation between Stacy Peterson, INCAT's Energy Program Director and Manager of the AgriSolar Clearinghouse, and Pete Berthelsen, the Executive Director of the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund and the President of Conservation Blueprint. It's the fourth in a series of AgriSolar Clearinghouse podcasts that are being featured on ATRA's Voices from the Field podcast. Pete and Stacy discuss the benefits of pollinator habitat at solar energy sites, pollinator habitat design, seed mixes, pollinator health and quality, and what anyone can do to help pollinators in their backyard. Let's listen. Hi, and welcome to Voices from the Field. I'm NCAT Energy Program Director Stacy Peterson, and I'd like to welcome Pete Berthelsen to the show. Pete is a renowned wildlife conservationist and pollinator expert. He's the Executive Director of the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund and the President of Conservation Blueprint. He has extensive experience in designing, establishing, and maintaining habitat plantings, providing services for folks wanting to plan, create, and maintain helpful and wildlife pollinator habitats. Pete works with solar development companies throughout the country to design and create plantings for pollinator health and habitat benefits on solar sites. Instead of planting solar sites, which is grass cover that will need to be mowed or trucking in gravel, he strategically designs seed mixtures of native grasses and wildflower seeds to plant on those sites. He balances and determines which plants can grow best in the shade of solar panels and many other important factors that are key considerations while creating pollinator paradise, brimming with nectar and pollen. He's also been a vital part of the AgriSolar Clearinghouse as one of our stakeholders. Pete, welcome. Thank you. I'm looking forward to our chat today. What? How can we have a better topic to talk about? This just brightens my day. I agree. So let's start with a broad question. Why should people care about pollinator health and their benefits on solar sites? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. I'll just start out with pollinators are a keystone indicator species. And for somebody that's listening, listening and be like, well, what does that mean? If you don't have good pollinator health, there's probably something wrong in your environment. So that's what a keystone indicator means. And then the other thing is obviously what it means for our food and our health. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have heard the saying that pollinators are responsible for one out of every three bites of food we take. But the other kind of factoid to think about with pollinators is pollination services produce over 90 crops that we consume for food sources. So wow. they're very valuable. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, and how did, how did you get started working in this, in, in designing solar projects that include pollinator uh, health? It was, it was kind of really, it was a natural progression as a wildlife biologist. And in the earlier parts of my career, I was a wildlife biologist that focused on things like pheasants and quail. And just over the course of my career, I realized that Everything that I said that we wanted on the landscape for pheasants and quail was exactly what we wanted for grassland songbirds, water quality, soil health, and pollinator species. And then I further learned that the more that I started talking about pollinators, you went from uh, 40 people in a room that were really passionate about pheasants and quail to 400 people. Yeah. in a room that are really passionate about this. And I didn't change the message one iota. So it's just something that's been a real natural progression. And the, the solar industry stuff kind of a little bit came out of left field. I didn't see it coming uh, when our phone started ringing because we were kind of a pollinator and pollinator habitat and management. And it just was a very natural connection. And it's something that I'm really, really excited about because of the opportunity to make a difference. That's great. You know, I, another just real basic question, what, are, what do you mean when you say pollinators? What, what is included in that? Well, the technical definition would be any critter that takes the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. So pollinators can be birds, rodents, 
all kinds of things because that can happen. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about pollinators, we mostly think about insects mm -hmm. because like bee species are like flying Velcro. <laughs> and when they land on that flower looking for pollen and nectar resources, the Velcro there, you know, the, the fuzzy body picks up all of that stuff and takes it to the next uh, flower. So it's one of those uh, miraculous sort of mechanisms in nature that just plug everything together. That's great. So how is this work different than, than a seed mix or, or, or work that you would do in a different type of ecosystem? How is it different at a solar site? Well, it's very, very different. And to some degree, we could spend a whole hour talking about just this subject, mm -hmm. but I'll give you a couple for instances. So in my earlier, younger career as a wildlife biologist, when I designed a seed mixture, never, ever did I have to sit and think about how tall will that plant grow? How am I going to design a seed mixture that will work really well when it gets minimal management? Okay. There's never going to be prescribed fire that runs through a solar site. One of our best management tools. Yeah, we hope not anyway. Um, the frequency and the height of mowing, there's just all kinds of things that are different that if I, as a wildlife biologist, was designing a seed mixture that was going in an open field for cattle grazing, for wildlife benefits, for soil health, for erosion control, I don't have to think about and plan on. Mm. So those are really, really important factors because if you don't think about them, it doesn't work. Right. Well, you know, you know another point I'm thinking of when listening to you is uh, you in the agricultural clearinghouse work, you've really helped us understand a lot about pollinators. And, you know, just because of something is flowering and just because it's beautiful, um, and, and there's a benefit to that for community acceptance, but it doesn't mean it's a good pollinator. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah. So I have, in almost every talk that I give, Stacy, I open it up with giving some foundational thoughts. Here's where I'm coming from. That's what a foundational thoughts are. And one of those is, that not all pollinator habitat is created equal. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what you're talking about. We've chatted about that a number of times. Just because a flower is out there doesn't mean that it has great pollen and nectar resources. Other foundational thoughts that I often talk about is when we get an acre of pollinator habitat, we have to make it the best it can be because we don't have enough acres of it. If we try to solve pollinator health and habitat using the same tools and techniques we've been using for the last decade, we will fail. So the status quo uh, won't get it done. And then the other foundational thought that I have is that we have to be working towards multi-species, multi-objectives whenever we're designing seed mixtures and working on a project. That's a solar energy project or any kind of project we have to design them to think about how to get as many benefits as we can. And what are the benefits? Like what, what, what are you, what type of- Yeah, so, so, so we know that pollinator health is in decline. We often hear about the monarch butterfly might get listed as an endangered species uh, later in 2023 or 24. Here's a collection of species that you almost never hear about that have been kicked in the shins harder. Grassland songbirds, 80% mm. population declines over the last 40 years. Wow. So I'm thinking about how can we design habitat that has pollinator benefits, grassland songbird benefits, water quality, soil health, food sustainability, um, just all of these sorts of things, renewable energy, comes in, um, you know, and how can we help a solar energy project reduce their costs by designing the right seed mixtures that touch all these things I just talked about, but also reduce their future operation and maintenance costs. Those are the multifaceted things that we try to pull together and really think about. So every seed mixture that we work on on a solar project 
I sometimes describe it as like this intricate kabuki dance mm -hmm. that has to think mm -hmm. about all of these many, many different factors. And if you don't think about all of them, you're not going to be as successful. That's great. So back to the grassland songbirds, it, are you seeing that there can be an improvement uh, at solar sites or are you seeing an impact there? Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> you know, most of these are like unnamed, unknown species, mm. but meadowlarks, grasshopper sparrows, you know, just think species like that, that need a grassland environment. Now, a solar project isn't going to work for every species, mm -hmm. but if we design it correctly, we can really uh, make a significant difference. And one of the ways, and maybe we'll talk about this in a little bit, but when the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund or Conservation Blueprint becomes involved in a solar project, almost invariably we design two seed mixtures, one for use within the array area and one in the buffer around the outside where we don't have these vegetative height limitations. And right. that is a much more traditional pollinator seed mix and that's where you can really ring that bell on helping things like grassland songbirds. That's great, great. So I wonder if we can get a little bit deeper into some of the the, the kabuki dance that you talked about. Um, <laughs> what are some considerations that you, you look at for forage and nutrition in a pollinator mix? Sure, so there's a lot of different factors that go into designing a seed mixture. And on a typical utility, scale solar project, there's like no less than 15 things in the seed design recipe, that kabuki dance. And our phone tends to ring when pollinator value is one of them. So that's the first one I'll give pollinator habitat, pollinator health and habitat benefits. But then there's a couple we've already talked about, vegetative growth height, you know, and on utility scale solar projects, my impression is, is that the solar industry is moving towards a leading edge panel height at full tilt, meaning the lower panel height. How high is it off the ground? Of about 20 to 24 inches. Okay. Right. So we're typically given the design guideline of thou shalt not use anything that grows taller than 18 inches tall. Sure. For that's, mm -hmm. that's challenging. Right. Okay. So that's one. So we, we've just covered two of them. Uh, cost effectiveness. Even if you're a multi million dollar solar project, you have a budget. And we have to make sure that the seed mixture designs are cost effective and they're actually commercially available for a project that is mm -hmm. one to two to 3,000 acres in size. It needs to be established easily and quickly. Um, we have to think about things like shade tolerance, mm -hmm. soil health benefits, fire danger, erosion control. The species we select have to be adapted to that site. And then they have to be able to persist there for 30 years wow. with minimal management. So that's like about 15. And then you can get the extra cherry on top with things like, do they want to graze it? Right. Is it? Are they using bifacial panels? And oh, by the way, let's design the seed mix mixture to have an increased albedo effect, the reflection of that light back up from the ground. Mm -hmm. Every one of those that I just listed is like co-equal. Right. Okay. So early on, I would sometimes see seed mixtures that a solar developer would bring to me and they'd say, well, we want to have pollinator value in here. And here's the mixture we've been given. And I would look at it and it'd be like, great pollinator mixture. Great. Right. Absolutely will not work on a solar project. And that's where all these other factors weren't designed into it. It was just thinking about pollinator value. So it, it really is this very intricate recipe. And it is the key to the success. I oftentimes joke about how the seed mixture, maybe this isn't a joke, maybe it's true. The seed mixture is like 0.1% of the total project budget. But if it's not right, it blows the whole project up. Right. So it's really important to get it right. Yeah. So 
do you also consider bloom time? Like, do you stage bloom time throughout the summer? Is is there, is, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. If pollinator health and habitat benefits are part of the project, and I'll just, <clears throat> aside here, Stacy, I'll tell you that my personal goal is that at some point in time in the future, essentially every solar project going in is going to raise their hand and say, well, of course we're going to include pollinator benefit because we know how to do it. We know what it costs. We know how to manage it. And it's the right thing to do. Exactly. We're not there yet, but we're trying to get there. So when pollinator health and habitat benefits are a part of it, we have to make sure that we're providing those benefits throughout the entirety of the growing season. Whether you are located in Michigan or you're located in Florida, mm -hmm. your growing season needs to have nectar and pollen resources readily available throughout the entirety of that growing season. Learn how to harvest the sun twice with practical information at NCAT's AgriSolar Clearinghouse. Get access to more than 400 peer-reviewed articles, the latest in AgriSolar news, and connect with farmers and solar developers who are working together to make the most out of our shared resources. We'll see you at agrisolarclearinghouse.org. Great. And what about water? Do you do you set up irrigation or are you wanting these sites to be able to, you know, to function without any, anything more than, than what's available? In a perfect world, we are designing a seed mixture to one of my 15 factors was adaptation to the site. Mm -hmm. We're selecting the species that want to be found there. And that's based on the soil type, but it's also based on things like precipitation. And so if we're able to thread that needle in that intricate recipe, then we are selecting species that should be able to thrive, succeed, and not need things like irrigation. My perspective is most solar projects operate with a pretty tight margin mm -hmm. and that it may be a number of years of producing energy before that project turns around to be profitable. Things like irrigation are going to be an expense that is very hard to add. So the, the wild card in that, Stacy, is the further west we go, the more challenging it is to find those species that are going to work. And so that's challenging. So I'm not saying that it doesn't ever have to happen and things like that, especially if we start trying to bring a multi-benefit of like agriculture under panels and things that might happen. But in a perfect world, we're able to hit the bullseye without things like irrigation if we've done it right. That's great. Yeah, in the West, I know that's something we're just constantly concerned with. You mentioned something I wanted to go back to. Um, you talked about the albedo effect. And mm -hmm. I think that's really important um, from the solar perspective to, to think about what the pollinators are bringing there. I mean, beyond the, you know, all the benefits of pollinator habitat, there's a benefit to the solar as well. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so it, it what an exciting time we live in where the efficiencies of solar energy are just, it's like every month there's a new efficiency that they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And currently panels are so efficient that it's actually a plus to put a panel on the backside, bifacial panels, and we can have a net positive gain from that. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, people would have laughed at that. Um, so where that's the case, we can tweak and design a seed mixture that hits all these other objectives that we just listed and reflects more light, the albedo effect. One of the kind of go-to things, the go-to species that we tend to use mm -hmm. when we have that 18 inch requirement and all these other things is we like to include white Dutch clover in the array area. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons being that it is documented to have an increased albedo effect. And you're talking about a plant species that checks every one of those boxes. You can mow it, it's cheap, it's commercially available, it'll be there for 30 years, checks every box and native bees and honeybees along with lots of other insect species, love it. That's great, that's great. 
So you've talked with me about a new solar program that the BM Butterfly Habitat just announced called Solar Synergy. Can you talk about this program a little bit and how it's going to work with solar developers? Yep. Very, very excited about this program. We've, uh, we're in the process right now of reaching out to solar developers and giving them our peak, our little sneak preview of it. Solar Synergy has four what I call buckets. The first bucket is we're going to work collaboratively with the solar developer, the EPC, to design a seed mixture. And we'll take that two seed mixture approach, one for the array area, one for the buffer area. The Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund will provide the buffer area seed mixture mm. free of charge. Wow. And we will work with the developer to, um, uh, to design that array mixture mm -hmm. and they will obtain it just like they always were gonna, mm -hmm. okay? So there's plus one. Bucket number two is we will be doing carbon sequestration monitoring from before the project starts through the first six years. Wow. And we will be documenting and monitoring any carbon sequestration gains. And if there are gains, we bring corporate entities that are ready, willing, and able to purchase mm -hmm. any carbon credits that might be monetized. Mm -hmm. They are already in queue with their hand up saying, you got carbon credits, we're here to buy them, okay? Bucket number three is pollinator health and habitat monitoring. Our close partners at the Monarch Joint Venture mm -hmm. will be conducting pollinator monitoring on the sites using drones that can identify and count milkweed uh -huh. on the project and boots on the ground that are doing a survey to observe what species are present in what abundance and what floral resources are they using. This is going to be incredibly important related to the monarch butterfly endangered species listing. Mm -hmm. This fulfills project monitoring requirements. And then the fourth bucket is we're actually going to connect commercial beekeepers to the project. Oh, wow. And I'm excited about this, really excited because I think of the sustainability messaging that a solar developer could have and think about them going to their next conference and they have a booth and handing out jars of solar honey yeah. that are produced on their yeah. site. Yeah. Think about uh, the messaging and the endorsement of two pollinator nonprofits, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund and Monarch Joint Venture at their next permitting hearing, talking about here's how we do pollinator benefits Here's how those benefits are documented. And here, here is our sustainability kind of holistic messaging. I think that it's a project that works really well. And then on every project in Solar Synergy, there will be a vegetation management plan that goes with that project to ensure that these pollinator benefits are designed, established, and maintained throughout the life of that project. That's it's amazing. it's very exciting. Can you talk a little about vegetation management and, and what, what that means and what it looks like? Mm -hmm. Well, the most important thing is to follow, have a vegetation management plan and follow it. Because we've already alluded to this, but on a solar site, some of the best tools for management we can't use. Um, we're never going to run fire through there. Mm -hmm. We're not going to put cattle on there because they like to rub on things and it wouldn't work. Um, so really we're down to kind of mostly three management tools or a combination of the three, mowing, herbicide use, or grazing, mm -hmm. primarily with sheep. And while nice, those are not the best management tools. And sometimes, you know, they're hard to get applied. So management is critically important. There's nothing that we can do where we want to have pollinator health and habitat benefits, where we plant it, walk away from it, and always have great benefits. Right. You have to be doing some management uh, each and every year. And, and so we're, that's all in that recipe of that seed mixture design and how we think about all those things and how they're going to be applied on a project. That's great. 
So back to your solar synergy program. I mean, it sounds like such a great program and I'm happy to hear Monarch Tort Adventures part of it. They just do great. Yeah. Had a good time visiting with them on our Minnesota tour and we had bear honey there. It was great. Will this be a national program? And are you, are you doing like a whole consortium of folks working on this or how are you going to be able to meet the need that's probably going to happen from this? Yeah, so we're going to work to meet the need as fast as we can. Right now we have corporate and foundation financial support, because obviously there's a cost. We're giving free seed, we're doing carbon sequestration monitoring, and we're doing pollinator monitoring. Mm -hmm. There's a cost. So in our this year in 2023, we will have a limited number of projects, and then money follows success. That's one of the great things that I've learned in life. <laughs> As we build our budgets, this is going to be a national program, and in a short number of years, we want to be working with hundreds of utility scale solar projects each and every year. And uh, we believe that we have a design and a plan for how to get to that point uh, to be able to do that. And it, it's just really exciting. I talked about my personal goal of wanting to have pollinator health and habitat benefits be included in more projects. This is part of one of the tools to get us to that point. That's great. That's great. So I mean, you mentioned financials, you know, and, and that's always a part of any project about, you know, what kind of cost increase or cost difference is there to do this at a solar site as opposed to like a bare ground solar site? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the vegetation management plans that we design at Conservation Blueprint, now I'm talking Conservation Blueprint, we design vegetation management plans, we design seed mixtures, we help procure them, we help line up installers. If all of those things are thought about from beginning to end on the project, this does not have to be an additional cost, okay? Wow. Especially if an entity like the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund comes along and provides uh, support on those seed mixtures. So we very thoughtfully considered that in our design. And one of those objectives that we're trying to touch is cost effectiveness. Right. And so um, it seed mixtures, and there's a lot of other things that go into it besides the cost of the seed mixture, but those are generally in the range of two to $300 an acre, mm -hmm. which is not yeah. much different mm -hmm. than just turf grass establishment. Right. Yep. Right. And so then it really comes down to, have we done the site prep right? Did we plant it the right way at the right time so that we can move quickly through this stage of establishment and get to the minimal management that we'll need to be producing pollinator health and habitat benefits? When every one of those steps is considered and every box is checked, the cost difference is minimal. Excellent. So... We also talked a little bit about beekeeping and you mentioned honey. How is there certain considerations that a site would have to have an apiary at, at the site as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to give you two factoids in part of my answer that I don't think the public probably knows. Fact number one is that currently commercial beekeepers are going through a period where there are about 40% annual losses of hives, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The mark at which their industry is sustainable is about 15% annual losses. Very, very challenging. There's a lot of things going on, mm -hmm. but we know that high quality pollinator habitat helps commercial beekeepers address those losses. That's great. That's number one. Number two, here's a point that I don't think many of our listeners are gonna know. In the United States, out of all the honey that we consume as a nation in one year, we only produce 25% of that honey in the U.S. Oh, I didn't know How that. many people listening right now knew that? Wow. It used to be much higher. Okay, so I'm excited about the relationships that we have in the commercial beekeeping industry and how on a utility scale solar project, let's just say it's a thousand acres in size. Mm -hmm. What a 1000 acre project that has high quality forage and nutrition habitat for native bees and honeybees could do to commercial beekeeping in the U.S. 
I want the percentage of the honey that we produce in the country to be much higher because that other 75% of the honey is coming from portions of the world, some of which you wouldn't be very excited to know it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, hopefully, like you say, hopefully this can make a huge difference. So, you know, just beyond beyond solar solar habitat, um, what can just your average person do to, to help support pollinators? Yeah, so and we've all heard the phrase, if you build it, they will come, mm -hmm. right? There is no better example of that happening than pollinators, okay? Later this year, if the monarch butterfly becomes listed as an endangered species, think about in your life, if you have a home with a yard and you have flowers in it, how many people listening to this podcast have ever been in a situation where an endangered species could come flying through your backyard? Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. And you have the opportunity to make a difference for an endangered species, whether it is the rusty patch bumblebee or the monarch butterfly. This isn't um, like a snail darter or um, uh, an owl species or something like that that are in different parts of the world. Right. We all have these critters that if we build it, if you have a butterfly garden in your backyard, even if you have potted plants on your deck, yep. you have pollinator species that show up and you can make a difference. So if you build it, they will come. That's great. That's great. Well, thanks so much for taking time to talk with me today, Pete. Where can folks go to learn more about all of your work? So I would recommend that people go to the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund website. Mm -hmm. They will be able to learn about solar synergy. They can hear past webinars and podcasts that we've had. Mm -hmm. They can sign up to receive free seed as an individual. Um, we have lots of cool photos on there and all kinds of things. And now uh, they can learn about that. And then the same thing for Conservation Blueprint. Uh, you can go to our website. Both entities are on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of that stuff. So like and follow. Yeah, I've seen your photos stay. on them and they're just gorgeous. So I agree. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, what a, what a great conversation. Is this not a great way to brighten up a day? Exactly. talking about pollinator health and habitat. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.